Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for coming out to our session today on advances in boreal disturbance research. My name is Martin Hunter, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo, and I'm joining in today from my research site in central Alberta, which sits on Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. This session is broken into two parts. We'll have six speakers this morning, and then we also encourage you to come out to our session at 2.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for the second part of the session with six additional speakers. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that the CGU Biogeoscience Section Annual General Meeting will be today at the midday break at 11.45 um, Central Time. Our talks today are going to be 12 minutes each with three minutes for questions, and you can use the Q&A box to type out a question and I'll read it out. And we'll aim to have a 10 minute break after the first three talks if we can stay on time. Uh, and for our presenters, yeah, you have 12 minutes and I will give you an applause sign when you have like a minute left to give you a heads up. So with that, I think we will begin. So our first speaker today is Dr. Ellie Goud. She will be presenting her work titled, Are Restored Seismic Lines Heading in the Right Direction? Comparing Taxonomic, Phylogenetic, and Functional Plant Diversity in Boreal Peatlands. So you can go ahead and share your screen. Thanks, Branda. Okay, hi everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be the first person in this really interesting session focusing on advances in boreal disturbance research. Um, my name is Ellie Good. I'm a postdoc at the University of Waterloo with um, Dr. Maria Strack, who we will be hearing from later this morning. Um, and this is a project that's in collaboration with the Boreal Ecosystem Recovery and Assessment Project and includes um, my co authors from the University of Plymouth as well as Natural Resources Canada. So um, all of the talks this morning in this session are actually focused on boreal peatlands. And um, as much as I want to assume that everybody knows what a peatland is, um, I will just very briefly go over peatlands just in case there is anybody out here that's unfamiliar with them. Um, so peatlands are a type of wetland um, here is a beautiful photo that I took just last week of a peatland in Ontario. Um, these are wetland ecosystems that accumulate an enormous amount of organic matter um, in their soils, which we call peat. And they um, accumulate this organic matter over millennia. And there's different types of peatlands. This one is called a bog. It's disconnected from the groundwater. It's very nutrient poor and acidic. There's other types of peatlands. Um, that are more dominated by grassy and herbaceous vegetation like a fen. And there's even peatlands, both bogs and fens uh, that can have quite a bit of tree cover growing in them like peatlands in Alberta. Either way, peatlands are generally characterized by having peat mosses, a ground layer of peat mosses. And these are really the ecosystem engineers that work to really define these wetland ecosystems. So in their undisturbed state, we're really interested in peatlands because they are net carbon sinks um, in a way that's very globally significant. So they do emit naturally sources of methane, but in general, their decomposition is so slow that they're able to store an enormous amount of carbon in the peat. However, when they are disturbed for a variety of reasons, they can become pretty significant sources of carbon to the atmosphere. And this is the focus of um, enormous amount of research and a lot of the research that you'll be hearing about this morning. So in this session, we're talking about boreal disturbances and we call this the boreal forest, but actually most of the boreal forest in Canada at least is peatlands. So it's more like the boreal peatland. So this is showing Canada, the boreal forest, boreal zone is this area that's highlighted and everything that is pink or red is a peatland. And so the focus of my research is actually in the um, Alberta oil sands region highlighted here. And you can see that easily half of this area is, is actually peatlands. So this area, I'll show a closer view of it. Um, this is the province of Alberta and the oil sands region is highlighted 
in um, orange. And so there's a variety of disturbances related to the oil and gas industry. Um, we might think of open pit mines, but there's all sorts of other uh, disturbances, including the infrastructure that's necessary to identify and locate these oil deposits. And so what I'm showing here in the middle photo, this is just a screenshot that I pulled off of Google map. Um, these lines, this perfectly chessboard looking grid, these are called seismic lines, where in order to find oil deposits, um, basically machinery has to be able to go up and down um, these ecosystems and look for oil under the ground. And so it's basically a network of roads, um, except they don't pave them. So they cut down the trees in order to allow the seismic equipment to drive up and down the forest or the peatland. And what this looks like on the ground is these photos here on the right, where all the trees have been cut down, the ground has been quite compressed. And some of these seismic lines could look like this 10, 20, 30 years later. And um, in peatlands, they can become uh, very, very wet as shown here on this, on this bottom photo. So just looking at this area, either from above or on the ground, you can see that these ecosystems are highly disturbed. They're highly impacted. Um, the land is physically dissected. Uh, it's exposing a lot of edges. And clearly, the woody vegetation has been removed. So what do we know about uh, the disturbances caused by seismic lines? We know that tree cover is gone. We know that the soils are highly compacted. We know that the microtopography has been removed. Um, the hydrology has been altered. A lot of these seismic lines, like I showed before, are very, very wet. And we also know that this has implications for carbon cycling, where um, carbon dioxide exchange has been altered. And in many cases, these seismic lines through peatlands are actually becoming hotspots of methane emissions. What are some things that we don't know? So we don't know um, the impacts of plant on plant diversity across scales. We don't know restoration success. And this is the focus of, of my work and this talk this morning. So what do I mean by plant diversity across scales? Scales, I mean looking at how are individual species impacted by these seismic lines. And not only just the species who's there, but deeper types of plant diversity, like their evolutionary relationships. Is there changes not only in individual species, but entire plant taxonomic groups? And then also thinking about functional change, because this is what's going to have such a big impact on ecosystem function, is do we have changes in the functional traits of these species or even entire functional groupings? And what I mean by restoration success, so in order to try to restore these seismic lines, to have less of an impact on carbon cycling and to restore natural um, wildlife habitat, et cetera, one method that is being applied currently um, is taken from forestry. This is called mounding, where literally a tractor comes in, takes a big scoop of peat, dumps it over. So it's the, the goal here is to try to recreate that microtopography that has been lost. And in theory, this will allow um, environmental variation to allow different types of plants to recolonize this area and hopefully return it back to a functioning um, peatland ecosystem with trees. But because these um, techniques have been employed relatively recently, we still don't have a sense at a broad scale um, whether these treatments that work well in the forestry industry, whether they work as well in a wetland ecosystem. So this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a picture of a seismic line that has had mounding applied to it um, within three years. So you can see these big sort of hills of mineral soil and then um, it leaves little pools of water. So the questions that we're really interested in is we want to know, does this mounding restoration technique bring the understory plant diversity closer to the reference conditions? And I'm also really interested in knowing if bogs and fens respond differently, because even though they're both peatlands, they are quite different in their, in their function and in their plant species composition. So on the left, we have a picture of a seismic line that's just been left to recover naturally. In the middle is one that's been treated for the rest of the talk. I'm going to call these seismic lines treated if they've had mounding applied to them. And then on the right is a completely undisturbed uh, reference peatland. So um, to answer these questions, we compiled vegetation surveys um, across Alberta in a number of sites. And then from those vegetation surveys, we could calculate 
the species that were there, changes in species composition. Um, I estimated an evolutionary tree, and then we also obtained plant functional trait data from the literature. So I'm gonna start by showing um, changes in species composition. So on the y-axis is the percent cover of um, major plant groups. On the x-axis, we have bogs on the left, fens on the right, and then um, R is the reference site, T is the treated lines, and the U is the untreated lines. So for both bogs and fens, those mounded lines are in the middle. And so these plant groups are structured in, um, in the way you would see this in the ecosystem. So the smallest things on the bottom, the moss on the bottom, going up to taller plants, and the trees on the top. So what we found right away is you can see just by looking at this, that the mounted lines look very different from the reference sites and the untreated lines. Two things really jump out. One is that the moss cover declines. And the other thing that really jumps out is we see this very light blue and yellow. This is referring to um, horsetails and graminoids, so grassy looking tall um, plants. And these seem to really increase on the mounded lines in the bog and on the mounded lines and the untreated seismic lines in the fen. And these changes in broad species groups translate into changes in species diversity and also phylogenetic diversity. So um, the first panel on the left, again, we've got that same order, bog and fen. And we see in the middle, at least for the bogs, that species diversity and phylogenetic diversity are really different on the mounds and that the reference sites are actually closer to the untreated seismic lines. But then the fens behave quite differently where the mounds are not so different and it's the untreated, um, it's the reference sites that are really distinct. So in order to really get at how these differences in plant species might translate into differences in function, we, like I said, obtain functional traits from uh, the literature. So this is leaf density, leaf nitrogen and phosphorus contents, and then overall plant height. And all of these traits are known to impact carbon and nutrient cycling at the ecosystem level and also competitive outcomes. So here I'm showing um, the community weighted mean for these four plant traits. And again, on the left, we have our seismic lines, in the middle, the mounted lines, and on the right are the reference. We didn't actually find a difference between bogs and fens as much here. So this is just um, the average of both peatland types. And you can see, again, in the middle, these mounted lines have a much higher uh, community weighted mean of all four traits. And this again translated into changes in overall functional diversity where those mounds are functionally behaving quite different than the reference sites and the untreated seismic lines. And these changes in plant functional traits are really indicating a shift towards faster growth, which could be more competitive or more resource acquisitive plant strategies. So in summary, we found that bogs and fens responded differently to disturbances created by seismic lines, and they've responded differently to the mounding restoration treatments. We found that mounding pushed the understory plant community function further from the reference system. And this has potentially broad implications where changes in plant diversity, although they might be temporary through early successional stages, but if these changes were to be sustained, this would likely affect tree growth through competition and potentially ecosystem carbon and nutrient cycling. And just a thought is potentially there could be less carbon storage overall if these plants have a more nutrient um, acquisitive and competitive strategy. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Very happy to accept any questions. Great, thanks Ellie for that. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, they can um, put them in the chat box and I can read them out. Um, and also if you think of questions later, you can always feel free to put it in and address it to Ellie and she can type out a response um, later on. I'll give people like a minute or so if they do have any questions, Take the time to type it out.
Okay, it looks like we have some questions that came in. The first one says, hello, Ellie. I'm just curious if there will be any carbon flux measurement across untreated mounding and reference sites. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, Maria Strack has a PhD student who is measuring carbon fluxes um, in all of these uh, site types and she might even be literally measuring fluxes right now as we speak. <laughs> so um, I will let Maria tell you that exciting news probably next year at this conference. Great. And then we have another question asking if, did you only consider treed fens or multiple types of fens in this work? Um, in this work, we're only looking at treed fens, um, but Yeah, we're only looking at treed fens. I mean, that that's like the main fen type that these seismic lines are running through in this um, in this part of Alberta. So that just happens to be where we've been working. Great, and then we'll do one final quick question. Someone asked that if the mounding is pushing further from the reference, do you think there's another restoration approach that would be better? I think that's a little bit of a complicated um, question. I would say, I, I would say it's, it's a little bit too early to tell in part because these ecosystems take thousands of years to develop and succession happens very slowly. And so when we're looking at these restoration treatments, we need outcomes in a human timeframe, but these peatlands aren't recovering in a human timeframe. So in one way, I think it's a bit too early to tell if these treatments are indeed successful. That being said, you can see from this photo on the top right that this particular type of mounding technique, it, it scoops the peat so far down that it is exposing mineral soil that hasn't seen the light of day probably in thousands of years. And so one outcome that we are seeing is because it's not peat being returned to create these mounds, it's mineral soil, so they are decomposing rapidly and they are encouraging non-peatland plants um, to grow on them. And so there are other types of mounding techniques where the peat profile is kept more intact. And I believe there's quite a bit of work really trying to improve these techniques for peatlands. Because again, like these techniques were developed for mineral soils. And so a lot of this is so new and experimental. Um, so I think, yes, potentially some restoration approaches might be better suited to peatlands, but it's still early days. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to our second speaker now, um, who is Chen Shi Wang, and he will be presenting his research titled Combined Impacts of Soil Salinity and Water Table on Juncus Balticus Growth and a Constructed Fen in the Alberta Oil Sands. So yeah, it looks like you've gone ahead. And, yeah, so you can start. Yes, thanks, Mirinda. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tian Shi Wang, and the topic I'm going to talk about is the oh, sorry the combined impact of soil salinity and water table on Junkers Balticus growth, a greenhouse experiment for fin reclamation in the Athabasca oil sands region. So this research is a part of the program uh, of the peatland reclamation supported by the government, universities, and the companies because the oil sands was buried underneath the peatlands. So this special ecosystem was destroyed after mining activities and backfilled with the high salinity waste. And this would cause land degradation, uh, water contamination, habitat loss, and CO2 release. Therefore, it is necessary to reclaim the landscape in proper ways. Uh, these two photos illustrate the changes of the Nikanuti fin uh, between 2014 and 2016 as the second um, peatland reclamation program in the world. Uh, this constructed fin was designed as a self-sustaining and carbon accumulating system. Uh, 
uh, one of the concerns in the uh, constructed fin is the soil salt threatening. From this plot, we can notice that the sodium concentration was stored uh, in the upland. Um, and um, uh, and but, but it is in the expe uh, expectation from the beginning because the oil uh, the tiling sands was used as the aquifer uh, during the construction. Uh, therefore, a uh, field mesocosm was conducted in the in the fin at 2014. Uh, different plant species was transplanted to the fin uh, to see how they are grown over time. Um, according to the estimation, it would spend uh, decays to let sodium flush through the watershed. So what we don't know is whether those plant composition would change over the time, uh, like persist over time. On the left plot, it is uh, a study about the uh, changes of above ground biomass for junkers and carrots in the fin between 2014 and 2019. The blue dots are junkers bauticus and the green square is carrots of cartilis. You can see from this plot, the junkers has been decreasing since 2014, while the carrots increased during this time. Junkus bauticus is a subtolerant plant and it provides uh, an ideal habitat for mosses regrowth. Um, we don't know whether uh, this change will uh, uh, this change will be changed with the increase of uh, sodium concentration in the fin because the wet region was uh, dominated by Taifa and carrots on the site, so we consumed, uh, so we assumed uh, water table could be uh, another factors would uh, impact the jungle's growth. Therefore, the uh, salinity and water table was chosen as the as the independent variables in the greenhouse experiment. So uh, the first objective in the green for this greenhouse experiment is how is Junkus bauticus growth and physiology affected by sodium concentration? And the second objective is, does water table position interact with the salinity to influence Junkus bauticus growth and physiology? There are seven salinity levels and two water tables was used in this experiment. The salinity level presents represent the concentration of sodium and the water table is the distance from the water surface to the soil surface. Uh, the layout of one of the toad was presented on the right image. There are seven toads corresponding to seven salinities uh, in the experiment. And in each toad, half of the parts was leveled up to create two water tables. During, ex during the experiment, uh, I measured the biomass in shoots of shoots and roots, physiological data, including stomatal conductance and photosynthesis rate, and the chemistry in shoots and roots. For the results in biomass, um, the X, uh, in this plot, X axis is the sodium concentration and the Y axis is the total biomass. The yellow boxes is the dry condition and the uh, uh, blue boxes represent the wet condition. From this plot, we can know that the total biomass is always higher in the dry, uh, in the dry treatment and the salinity and the combined factors do not have the obvious uh, impact on, uh, on the biomass. For the leaf physiology, uh, we measure the photosynthesis rate and stomatal conductance. On the left plot, um, the y-axis is the photosynthesis rate and the x-axis 
axis is the sodium concentration. From this plot, we can know that the photosynthesis rate decreases with the salinity increase only in the wet treatment, especially at the 2300 uh, uh, sodium concentration. Uh, and uh, the photosynthesis rate is always higher in dry treatment. However, on the right plot, we can know the variation of the stomatal conductance is not related to the treatment. It is an interesting uh, finding to prove the photosynthesis decouples with the stomatal conductance. We also, also measure the carboxylation rate and the electron transport rate during the experiment, and we found they have the same Tend a uh, change with the photosynthesis rate. The chemistry in sh uh, shoes and roots directly reveal the impact of uh, those variables on um, uh, in the plant tissues. Uh, we can we can see for both roots and shoots the sodium potassium ratio increased with the increase of salinity. Um, and we can say that the high sodium potassium ratio represents more uh, salt stress in the plant tissue. Another finding is that the sodium potassium ratio is uh, always higher in the wet condition. Um, what's more, uh, this ratio is much higher in roots than in shoots. Uh, as a conclusion, um, we can say that uh, the salinity do have the uh, impact on, so, uh, on Junker's growth in terms of photosynthesis rate and the sodium potassium ratio. Uh, but the water table has more um, impact on, on the Junker's growth uh, because the uh, biomass uh, and for the synthesis rate is always lower in the wet condition and the sodium potassium ratio is always higher in the wet condition. For the salinity and water table impact uh, on the junk asbaltica's growth, um, we found uh, at uh, the highest salinity and high water table would cause uh, the lowest photosynthesis rate and the highest sodium potassium ratio uh, 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 ratio. And this ratio uh, increased sharply with the salinity increase under the white condition. And to answer my objectives, uh, how is the junk asbaltica's growth and physiology affected by sodium concentration? Uh, the answer is uh, the sodium concentration has the negative impact on the junk asbaltica's growth in terms of the photosynthesis rate and uh, sodium potassium ratio. And for the second question, uh, does the water table position interact with the salinity to influence junk asbaltica's growth and physiology? And my answer is yes. And uh, the water table uh, plays an important role on Junkers Bauticas growth. Mm -hmm. And we found um, the high uh, salinity and high water table has the worst uh, impact on Junkers growth in this experiment. So um, if you want to improve the productivity on the Junkers Bauticas in the constructed fin, more uh, dry habitats should be created during the reclamation. And thank you so much for your listening. Great, thank you. And yeah, so if anyone has any questions for Tianji, you can put them in the chat. Thank you.
Okay, it looks like we have a question. Um, they asked, were you surprised that the stomatal conductance was unresponsive or was this in line with your predictions? Yeah, I, I was surprised because in common sense, the photosynthesis rate like is um, have a tight relationship with the stomatal conductance because the stom stomata would like control the CO2 in that uptake by the plant. So in my, um, I was assumed uh, if the photosynthesis was inhibited by the salinity, uh, the stomatal conductance should be also like inhibited, but the finding is not show this result. So I was uh, surprised for this finding. Great, and we have another question asking if the industry is planning to test different wetness conditions in field conditions. Uh, so I think in the field, is the industry planning to test out different wetness treatments? Uh, yeah, on the constructive fin, uh, like we, uh, we set uh, different colors uh, in the constructed fin at different water table uh, levels uh, from uh, minus uh, 10 to minus uh, 50 centimeters in the field. So yeah, in the future, uh, uh, like there's different um, water table levels will be tested in, in the field. Great, thanks. And I don't see any more questions. So I think we can move on to our next speaker, but um, if you do have any more questions, you can put them in the chat and for any of our past presenters and we'll be happy to answer them. So our third speaker today is Murdoch McKinnon and he will be presenting his research titled Boreal Peatland Reclamation Through Partial Well Pad Removal, Understanding Biogeochemical Dynamics Supporting Fen Moss Initiation. So yeah, you can go ahead. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, and I do apologize in advance if there's any background noise, um, but I'm doing my best to, to mitigate that. Um, yeah, so today I'll be presenting the biogeochemical dynamics um, supporting the fan moss initiation on a, a single well pad located in Northern Alberta. Um, so I'll start out by explaining what a well pad is and why exactly we have them. So Canada is home to one of the world's largest proven oil and gas reserves. Uh, but only about 80% uh, or 20% of those reserves are accessible through open pit mining. And the remainder is accessible only through what are called in situ methods, which involve drilling to depths of hundreds to thousands of meters uh, below the ground surface. And doing this requires the construction of a stable base for drilling and extraction infrastructure, which requires um, basically the placement of uh, well pads uh, onto the, the peat surface. And these are constructed by placing a layer of upland mineral fill um, in a thickness of about one to two meters thick. And what this does is it basically eliminates all natural peatland ecosystem function from the direct footprint of the pad. And accordingly, there's a legal requirement that the owners and operators of these pads um, return them to what's called a state of equivalent land capability, which is defined for well pads located in peatlands as the reestablishment of a peat forming carbon sequestering um, vegetation community. And one of the methods that's being trialed to do this um, is the complete removal of all of the place mineral fill, followed by uh, introduction of mosses to the re-exposed peat substrate, which you can see in the photo here. And while this technique is promising in terms of bog establishment, it's not well optimized for the establishment of fens, um, because fen mosses have high nutrient requirements and the exposed peat substrate um, left after removing the fill is nutrient limited. So accordingly, an alternative technique has been uh, proposed whereby a well pad is only partially removed by essentially shaving some of the mineral material off to lower its surface to the elevation of the water table in surrounding peatlands. Um, again, followed by the introduction of mosses through the moss layer transfer technique to the uh, re-wetted mineral substrate. Uh, and at the plot scale, uh, it's been found that this technique does result in sufficient biogeochemical conditions for fen vegetation initiation, uh, assuming that 
uh, there's sufficient hydrological connectivity between a remnant pad and adjacent peatland uh, to maintain anaerobic conditions consistently through the growing season. And it's also been found that the technique works best when you basically collect mosses for introduction to the pad from a donor fen with similar pH to electrical conductivity and calcium content as the remnant pad that will be their sort of final new home. Um, and while the technique is promising at the plot scale, it had never been scaled up to the size of a full well pad. So there was some uncertainty around whether optimal biogeochemical conditions would be uh, maintained across uh, a fairly large area. And accordingly, what we did was we lowered the uh, surface of an entire one hectare well pad through partial removal. Um, and you can see the result of that process in the image here. We've got the partially removed area at the bottom. Um, and then we basically shaved the mineral material off um, into an extension of an existing upland ridge to the north of the site. Um, you can see kind of a cross section of the results of our work down below. We then followed that up with introduction of mosses from a nearby moderate rich donor fen community. Um, and then set out to really address a couple of objectives. First was to characterize the physical chemical properties of the remnant mineral substrate, just to understand what we're working with, how the characteristics of the soil might be affecting biogeochemical dynamics. And then secondly, to assess nutrient availability to the mosses we introduced to the site, which of course will be one of the major factors in determining the success of this technique at scale. So to characterize physical chemical properties, um, I measured pH and EC of pore water both on the remnant pad, off the remnant pad, and at the donor site using a handheld probe, and collected samples for analysis of total extractable nutrients and percent organic matter. Um, given the necessity of maintaining anoxic conditions, I also measured soil moisture, um, as well as decomposition using the teabag index. Uh, the reservoir of available nutrients on the pad and off site was assessed uh, through the collection of pore water and the analysis of that water for nitrogen and phosphorus uh, concentrations. And then lastly, I installed plant root simulator probes, which you can see in the photo here, uh, to quantify the near surface nutrient flux profile, which can be considered sort of an approximation of nutrient supply uh, to the mosses at the surface. Um, and those were buried for uh, a period of three days to avoid uh, biasing of the results by high valence nutrients in the soil. So taking a look at the physical chemical data, the remnant mineral fill is really nutrient rich, having especially high levels of calcium, iron, and magnesium, but also elevated levels of potassium, phosphorus, and uh, a range of micronutrients that I'm not showing here. So this suggests that the mineral fill should in theory be capable of supporting supply uh, of a wide range of nutrients to mosses introduced to the surfaces. Um, the remnant mineral fill, though, does have a fairly low organic matter content, less than 2%, which certainly has some potential implications on uh, nutrient cycling, um, as well as uh, it creates sort of the potential that nutrients might be leached out of the um, mineral substrate fairly quickly. Taking a look at the water chemistry on the site, the peatlands adjacent to the pad um, are moderate rich fens, as evidenced um, by their slightly acidic pH um, and elevated electrical conductivity, sort of between 100 and 250 microsiemens per centimeter. Uh, the donor fen shown in the photo on the right here was also um, a moderate rich fen, although it had a lower conductivity and a lower pH than the peatlands around the pad. Uh, and then the water chemistry on the pad itself was a little bit different and was sort of similar to what we would expect to see in either a moderate rich or perhaps more an extreme rich fen with a near neutral pH um, and uh, a considerably elevated electrical conductivity. And it's important to note that the values on the pad are uh, quite a bit higher than what we're seeing in the donor fen. So it suggests that this sort of choice of donor fen is not perfectly optimized for introduction to this pad, uh, but because both are still within the classification of rich fen, I don't expect that it'll be a major limitation on moss establishment. Taking a look now at soil moisture, we basically have two conditions on the pad. Um, on the upgradient, portion of the pad where the water is kind of coming up against the mineral fill. Um, we have hydrologically connected areas, which are shown in the plot on the right here uh, in blue. And in those areas, we have uh, volumetric water content that's pretty consistently near saturation. It drops down a little bit towards the late season, but it's not uh, a really uh, serious uh, effect. However, hydrological connectivity through the mineral pad itself is limited, which is resulting in uh, hydrologic isolation of the down gradient and interior portions of the pad. Uh, whereby the late season, as shown in brown on the plot here, um, volumetric water content was uh, statistically um, significantly lower than volumetric water content uh, in the early season, um, typically 10 to 20% lower than in the connected areas. 
Um, and the basically as a result of this hydrological isolation, um, what we see is that decomposition in the um, hydrologically isolated areas was significantly higher than in the hydrologically connected areas um, because uh, of the sort of more aerobic conditions that we were seeing in that area. However, they were still anoxic enough um, that decomposition on the downgrading isolated portion of the pad did not uh, statistically vary from what we saw in the adjacent peatlands. So it suggests that we do have the development of some wetland decomposition processes on the remnant pad, which is uh, promising news. Taking a look at uh, nutrient flux profile, which again sort of approximates nutrient supply to mosses introduced to the surface, we see that as a result of the high nutrient content of the remnant mineral fill, uh, we see the supply of calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus on the pad being either comparable to what we see in the adjacent peatlands, or in most cases being higher than what we see uh, in the adjacent peatlands. Uh, so this suggests, um, you know, that these, again, nutrients are not likely to be limited. Um, within the pad itself, sort of outlined in red on these plots, we see that nutrient supply was higher in the hydrologically connected areas than it was in the isolated areas. Uh, although even in the isolated areas, um, it was never lower than what we saw in the peatlands, so uh, we don't have to worry too much about nutrient limitation. Um, and so this basically suggests that nutrient supply is closely associated with soil moisture, um, but, but conditions are still looking pretty good. And I'll note that other, these sort of similar trends were noted for a range of other micronutrients um, that I'm not presenting here, but it suggests that um, for most of the nutrients we're hoping to see on the site, we, we do in fact have them. Switching over to nitrogen, uh, the supply of nitri nitrate in the early season um, was below the limit of detection, which is not surprising given the really high soil moisture conditions um, in the early season. Um, although we did see the development or, or the development of some nitrate supply later in the growing season uh, in the hydrologically isolated areas uh, where soil moisture levels were lower at that time. Uh, taking a look at ammonium, the supply of ammonium was higher than that of nitrate um, in the early season in the hydrologically connected area, uh, although it was not above the limit of detection in the isolated area, despite it being sort of similarly wet. So I'm not exactly sure why that's occurring. Um, also somewhat expect, unexpectedly, the ammonium supply was higher in the isolated areas in the later season uh, than in the connected areas. Um, but I think this may be a result of basically some nutrient redistribution in the connected areas because of the um, good connectivity with the adjacent peatlands in those areas. Um, but overall, we might expect to see some nitrogen limitations on the remnant pad. Switching over now to the available nutrient reservoirs, so pore water nutrient concentrations, um, we see that really there's very little phosphate in the pore water, um, which contrasts a little bit with the high rates of supply that we saw, which suggests to me that perhaps phosphate is being immobilized due to the high levels of calcium that we have on our site. Um, and so the PRS probes may have been picking up other forms of, uh, of phosphorus. Um, similar to the low levels of nitrate supply, we see relatively low um, nitrate concentrations in the pore water negligible concentrations or, or below limit of detection in uh, the first growing season, which was fairly wet. And then uh, the development of some uh, nitrate in, in the pore water in the drier second growing season, um, but still relatively low. Um, this again kind of uh, indicates the likely development of anoxic nitrogen cycling processes. And that also resulted in higher um, concentrations of ammonium in the pore water. I'll point out that the scale on the side of these plots is very different. There's quite a bit more ammonium than there is nitrate, which again, in terms of wetland biogeochemistry, uh, is a very promising supply uh, or promising news. Um, so in conclusion, the biogeochemical dynamics on the pad are essentially trending towards what we would expect in a moderate to an extreme rich FEN system, um, although nitrogen limitation is quite likely. Um, additionally, nutrient supply is quite sensitive to water stress, particularly in hydrologically isolated areas and particularly in the late season, which suggests that there's a need to optimize hydrological connectivity um, across partially removed well pads to ensure that uh, site-wide anoxic conditions are maintained throughout the growing season. Um, and I'll just point out uh, sort of beyond the scope of this presentation, but we do have the establishment of some fen vegetation on the site. This is sort of a post two year image uh, on the right hand side. So it appears that these biogeochemical dynamics are supporting a uh, vegetation community that we would like to see. Uh, and so in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge our funding partners, Environment Climate Change Canada, NSERC and Mount Royal University Institute for Environmental Sustainability, uh, as well as our academic partners and the research assistants I've had the pleasure of working with.
Uh, so I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks Murdoch. Um, as we're waiting for people to put questions in the chat, I'll ask one of my own. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, and you might not know the answer to this, but do you have any ideas what could be done to increase that hydraulic connectivity between that upper and down gradient portion? It's a good question. We're certainly exploring a few different options. One is sort of creating cross uh, trenching on the surface uh, of the pad to try to get some surface water flow from the upgraded peatland into the hydrologically isolated areas. Um, the risk in doing that, though, is that you'll have quite a bit of surface water on your site, which is not optimized for the establishment of peatland mosses, particularly. Um, and then the other risk, too, is that you can get some sort of undesirable species like cattails coming in um, on the edge or within those trenches. Um, aside from that, there's maybe potential for putting some sort of subsurface irrigation systems in on these sites, um, but that would probably be very cost prohibitive um, and not very attractive to industry, who ultimately would be the ones implementing this technique uh, going forward. Yeah, so, it's a tough question. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you have some good ideas. Uh, and then we have a question in the chat asking if you have an idea of how variable fill chemistry would be among different well pads. Yeah, it's a good question. There hasn't been a whole lot of work to date. Um, previous studies have found, though, that these mineral fill materials do tend to be enriched um, in sort of magnesium, uh, as well as micronutrients, calcium, but they tend to be somewhat more limited in nitrogen and phosphorus. And I think that would be pretty consistent across the boreal region. Um, there might be some differences though between, uh, for example, clay versus sand substrates. Um, this particular site is very sandy, whereas uh, a large number of these pads um, are clay substrates, which um, certainly would have different nutrient exchange uh, characteristics as well. Great, thanks. And uh, seeing that there are no other questions, um, we're doing pretty well for time. So I think we'll take our kind of scheduled break and we'll come back at uh, 9.20 to give people a chance to get a snack or go to the bathroom. Um, and yeah, we'll come back with Dr. Maria Strack presenting at 9.20.
Hey everyone. So I think we will get started with our three final speakers. So I'll now introduce our fourth speaker, Dr. Maria Strack, and she will be presenting her research titled Restoration of Oil Sands Well Pads to Peatlands, Evaluating the Return of Carbon Sink Function to Inform Restoration Practice. So you can go ahead. Thanks very much, Miranda, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, great session today and very happy that Murdoch went before me, so maybe we'll give me back a couple minutes um, where I won't have to explain well pads uh, in quite as much depth. Um, so just before I start, I do want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors. So Michael Lemmer is a former PhD student, co-supervised by myself and Lynn Rashford at Laval University, and she just recently defended. And then our great collaborators, uh, Vin Shu and Melanie Bird at the Nate Boreal Research Institute in Peace River. Um, I also wanna thank our funding partners. Um, this work I'm gonna show today is kind of a compilation from several ANSERC funded programs uh, in collaboration with Canadian Natural Resources Limited and Imperial Oil. Uh, some of the data was also uh, compiled by Scott Davidson and Alexandra Angering. Uh, and then of course, there's been many summer students who have help to collect flux data over the years. So Murdoch already gave a great introduction to well pads in um, the Western Boreal Forest. And I just wanna highlight uh, once more sort of why we have this need for well pad restoration to peatland. And that's because if we think about, or if we look at a map of the peatland distribution in the province of Alberta, where anything in orange or red here is more than 50% peatland area, you can see that unfortunately for peatlands, they tend to be located in areas where we also have the oil sands deposit in the province. Um, and as was introduced, although we often think of these large open pit mines, the vast majority of this resource is too deep for surface mining and so needs to be extracted with in situ methods which require the creation of well pads. Uh, and so these well pads actually in the boreal will disproportionately fall on peatlands just because of that peatland distribution. And so we estimate that there's probably close to 100,000 hectares of these well pads that exist on peatland area. So in the 1960s, when this, these well pads were first being constructed, um, really the plan would have largely been that they would have been left as something like an upland island in the wetland matrix. So we, we would have ended up with then a conversion to some type of a field or a forest type of environment. But with uh, advances in Alberta wetland policy and changes now in sort of documentation that's been provided in terms of reclamation criteria, and even guidance on how to perform peatland and wetland restoration, there really is an increased emphasis on returning ecosystem function, including habitat, hydrologic conditions, biogeochemical cycling, and for peatlands, one of the most important aspects being carbon sequestration. And so when we start to think about ways in which we could restore these well pads, we can go back and sort of think about what we know about peatland establishment. And so one idea might be to completely remove the well pad, in which case you would tend to have a lot of compacted peat underneath in very wet conditions. And we could imagine then the creation of a peatland here through the process of terrestrialization, where basically the plant material would, would sort of start to grow out over that pond and accumulate carbon that would fill that with peat. But we could also imagine that this may take a very long period of time for that succession to occur. Alternatively, and as Murdoch presented in the previous uh, study, we could think about the process of pollutification, which is where the peat material, the, the accumulated peat from the peatlands sort of starts to expand over mineral soils. And this is actually how most of the peatlands in this part of the world would have been created. Alternatively, we could kind of try to kickstart this peatland process by trying to expose peat at the surface. And we could do that either by partially removing some of the well pad, but burying it under peat substrate in a process called inversion, or when we completely remove the pad, actually trying to decompact that peat in order to get the right elevation again. And so that may bring us, you know, it would allow us to have a peat substrate that may sort of allow peatland type plants to establish a little bit faster. So when we think about restoration, we're thinking about both sort of what are the actual civil earthworks we're going to do, how are we going to remove the pad, and then also how will we revegetate it. 
Um, and we can learn something from the peat harvesting uh, horticultural industry where they've developed this moss layer transfer technique where you sort of transfer the, the surface layer of a peatland onto the site. And this includes the moss, but also seeds and, and rhizomes of the vascular plants that could reestablish. We could also just allow for natural ingress. So just the plants from the adjacent community and, and seed dispersal to, to revegetate the site, or we could actively plant um, propagated peatland plants onto the site. And so I'm gonna use this presentation today to go over sort of what have we learned from some of these trials that have been done over the last about 10 years with a focus on the return of carbon cycling, but I will provide a bit of information on the drivers of that, like the vegetation communities and um, the hydrologic conditions. Uh, the sites I'm gonna to talk to you about are from the Cold Lake uh, and Peace River region. And so I do wanna acknowledge that this work then occurred on Treaty 6 and Treaty 8 territory which are the traditional and unceded lands of Dene, Cree, and Métis peoples of Northern Alberta. So I'm gonna show you some data from four different uh, well pad projects today. In all cases, we collected the carbon flux data using closed chamber techniques, both on the pads and in the adjacent understory. And uh, so just to remember that in the adjacent peatland, we really only measured carbon cycling in the understory and I'll sort of highlight what that means when we get to the data. And a variety of methods were used across these pads. The first site, the iPad site, um, we collected data two to four years post restoration. There were sections where the pad was completely removed and the peat decompacted and others where it was partially removed and buried. So we had um, peat at the surface. And then the whole site was revegetated with the moss layer transfer technique, which I'll abbreviate MLTT. And it was situated within a poor fen. Um, similar to that site is pad 822, which they then applied the same technique across a whole well pad scale of complete removal with decompaction and revegetation with moss layer transfer technique. And it sat in a bog, but where there was a bit of a flow through fen system on one edge. And so our reference sites incorporate both. Testing more of a sort of uh, leaving some of the pad in place, we have H38 where they did have areas with complete removal, but without decompaction, but also areas where they scraped that pad down, um, sort of as Murdoch introduced in the previous presentation, and then allowed natural ingress to, to revegetate the site. And we measured their nine to 10 years post restoration, and it was situated in a rich fen. And finally, Skeg, where they also scraped that surface down for a partial removal, but leaving the mineral soil at the surface and actively planted some fen species, although this site is situated within a bog. So um, we've our, Micah had already gone and sort of collected what were some of the vegetation outcomes from the site. Um, and so I, I show that here. There's sort of a lot of numbers here, but I'll just highlight a few things. We did have some unrestored sections of a pad and you can see that these can actually become quite well revegetated, but they're really, relatively devoid of peatland species. So you more have like a field, kind of a grassy field type of a plant community. Um, I think the most important thing here is that a variety of different restoration techniques that, that have been tested can lead to quite a high plant cover and a high proportion of peatland species. Uh, the other important point to take home here is that just because we plant peatland species doesn't necessarily lead to them dominating the peatland plant community because what we found is that the outcomes are really more dependent on that hydrologic connection and the conditions that you create on site, um, that the availability of plants is not necessarily the biggest constraint. That being said, um, we do have some evidence from the iPad site that moss layer transfer technique can be quite important for bringing moss cover and peatland specific species, particularly in the early years. So we have some sections of that site that were left to natural ingress. And then we tested a variety of different donor sites. And what we see is about a 5% increase in those first three years in the moss cover and an up to almost 20% increase in the proportion of peatland specific species. So this does suggest that bringing that donor material can kind of kickstart your return to a, at least a peatland plant species dominated community. The other important driver of carbon cycling is, are the hydrologic conditions. 
And if we kind of group everything together across all those different restoration treatments, we see that on average, the restored pads are quite similar to the adjacent natural peatlands, but a little bit wetter. Uh, and they're significantly warmer. So I'll start with the temperature first, where we see both the unrestored and restored sites remaining significantly warmer than the natural peatland. And this comes back to the fact that peatlands in this region are, are largely forested systems. And so even in a restored condition, we still haven't returned that canopy cover and that allows the surface conditions to remain warmer just because of a lot more available solar radiation. The water table story is more that we see a lot of variation, and this is because what water table you get really depends on the restoration methods and the decisions that you make. So if we break that down between the different treatments, and here I'll always for the next graphs be showing you the natural bogs and fens, a variety of restoration treatments, and then the unrestored site on the right. And we have here complete removal, complete removal with decompaction, partial removal where we've exposed peat at the surface and then partial removal where the mineral soil remains at the surface. And what we see is when we have complete removal, we really get significantly wetter conditions. And that's pictured in the top right where we get flooded conditions because that peat has been highly compressed under the pad. And this is likely to lead to marsh-like conditions that will persist for, for quite some time. The other thing I want to point out is when we have partial removal, we can have quite variable conditions. And that's because it really depends upon how far we decide to scrape that pad down. So our management decisions or our restoration decisions will really drive our water table position. So what does all this mean for carbon cycling? Um, so I'll start with carbon dioxide, looking at photosynthesis and respiration rates. And I think the take home message here is that there really isn't a huge difference across our restoration treatments. Um, productivity returns relatively quickly and um, can be similar to our natural uh, adjacent natural fens. Uh, and here negative values indicate greater productivity of the plant communities. Similarly, respiration is not sort of clearly different between our restoration treatments, but is, has been lowered by restoration. So in sort of bringing the pad back into more wetland type conditions, we have reduced our ecosystem respiration compared to our unrestored sites. If we put this together um, and into net ecosystem exchange, and these are just sort of midsummer values, we can see that all of our sites can, we can create a conditions for a carbon sink, but they're not necessarily significantly different than if we hadn't done restoration at all. Um, but I think it's important to remember that this is only summertime values. So we really do, do need more studies that look at annual carbon cycling um, because this litter might be better uh, protected over the winter in those anaerobic conditions and actually starting to look now at peat accumulation rates on these sites. The other thing to note here is that these are the understory values only for the natural peatland. So if we include some estimates of the forest, they would probably sit a bit more like this. And then we would see that our pads are sort of in line with what we see in the natural systems. The last part of the story is methane. And the biggest finding here really is that when we have those flooded conditions that occur in complete removal, we get significantly higher methane emissions. This isn't surprising. Um, because we know there's a strong relationship between water table position and methane. And we see again, even in our natural fens with flooding, we can get high methane emissions. So in conclusion, what we found by sort of bringing this data together is that many different methods can lead to the hydrologic conditions and plant communities that we need to return carbon exchange similar to the regional reference peatlands. The only one that we need to sort of avoid likely is this complete pad removal that leads to deep inundation. So some decompaction is required. Plant reintroduction is not necessarily required, but moss layer transfer technique does improve early um, moss and peatland species establishment. And if we decide not to add plants, we need a good hydrologic connection and a source of peatland propagules close by. But I think for me, the biggest take home is we do have techniques that work. So peatland restoration is possible with appropriate site planning and should be the target when well pads are situated in peatland ecosystems. So I think I have 30 seconds left for questions, Miranda. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, if there's any quick questions, um, we can take them, but also uh, you can put it in the chat and Maria can answer it um, during one of the next presentations. Okay, yeah, maybe we'll move on to our fifth speaker. But yeah, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat for her to answer. So yeah, our fifth speaker today is Abigail Shingler, and she will be presenting her research titled Impacts of Wildfire on Greenhouse Gas Dynamics and a Bog Peatland in Central Alberta. So you can go ahead. Great. Thank you, Miranda. And thank you to all of the other presenters today for some really interesting talks so far. Um, so my name is Abigail Shingler. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a master's student in the wetland soils and greenhouse gas exchange lab at UW. And today I'll be presenting some of my work on the impacts of wildfire on greenhouse gas dynamics in a bog peatland in central Alberta. Um, so some of the objectives of the study, so the two main objectives um, relevant to the work that I will be presenting during this talk are one, to quantify methane and carbon dioxide emissions in a peatland post wildfire, and two, uh, to determine the impacts of environmental variables such as soil temperature, moisture, and water table position on methane emissions in a peatland post wildfire. So the third objective uh, relates to the findings of this research and some additional work that I've done in relation to this research that I won't have uh, time to go into depth about today, but it's to determine the impacts of wildfire and the produced charcoal on the methane cycling microbial community and methane production potential and oxidation in a peatland post wildfire. Um, so just going into wildfires in peatland, so wildfires do have significant impacts on carbon fluxes in peatlands and can trigger a large release of carbon during combustion and methane emissions post wildfire are understudied and not well understood. So that's where my some of my research comes in. Um, but before discussing my research sites, I would like to acknowledge that this research takes place within Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. And I also acknowledge that this statement is only a small step in the process of decolonization and understand that reconciliation requires systemic change. So looking at my first study site, uh, Tomahawk Bog, it is located in central Alberta and it's situated at the edge of a previously harvested but now restored bog. Um, this site was impacted by the Tomahawk wildfire, which started during the first week of May in 2021, so last summer, and burned 2,219.2 hectares of land. Um, this fire was not 100% contained for nearly two weeks, and when field measurements were taking place um, in early August of 2021, there were periods of smoldering within 400 meters of the bog. Um, last summer was unseasonably hot and dry for this region, which contributed to the intensity and duration of this wildfire. So at this site, we could see evidence of severe charring on the trees, which is pictured here as well as an obvious charcoal layer uh, covering the surface of the bog. Uh, the majority of the hummocks were sphagnum or feather moss dominated and were either burned or at least singed by the fire. Um, we did see shrub type vegetation begin to reestablish across this landscape as by this time a few months um, had passed since the burning had taken place and the average peak depth at this site was 1.4 meters. So we also had a natural reference site, and it is also located in central, Bird, central Alberta, and it is approximately 20 kilometers northwest of the burn site. And it is located a few hundred meters away from an actively harvested peatland, and is also classified as a bog type peatland. And the average peat depth at this site is 4.6 meters. So some of the methods for my study. So at each of the sites, eight plastic flux collars were installed flush to the surface of the ground as pictured here. Um, half of these collars were installed on hummocks and half on hollows so that we could compare greenhouse gas emissions for both topography types. Um, water table wells were also installed at both of the sites 
and carbon dioxide and methane fluxes were measured using a Lycor brand portable greenhouse gas analyzer. So the fluxes were three minutes long using the closed chamber method in both light and dark conditions and were taken eight times during August and September of 2021 at each of the sites. So depth of burn at the burn site um, was measured using the widely accepted protocol where depth of burn is estimated by creating transects bounded by two reference points. Um, so for example, unburned sphagnum or exposed tree roots and measuring the vertical distance between the reference surface and the post fire surface. The average depth of burn for Tomahawk bog was 17.5 centimeters, which would categorize it as severely burned. So going into the results of this study, so for the carbon fluxes, we can see that ecosystem respiration is higher at the burn site when compared to the natural site. And this can be attributed to vegetation and soil litter uh, combustion during the fire, which results in a release of carbon. After vegetation is removed during fire, we would expect uh, carbon dioxide lost from the system, which is what we are seeing here, especially for the burned hollows, which most likely experienced more severe burning uh, than the hummocks due to their position on the landscape and their lack of ability to retain as much soil moisture as hummocks. Um, so looking at gross ecosystem production, so a very low GEP, Maria mentioned this in her presentation, but I'll just explain it quickly here, but um, so close to zero, or in our case, um, we have a GEP value that is slightly above zero, is indicating that almost all productivity has been lost. Uh, the more negative a GEP value is, the higher the gross ecosystem production. So both the burned and the natural site have very low GEP values especially for a bog ecosystem. And however, at the burned hollows, we can see that GEP is positive, which means that all productivity was lost. Um, the burned hummocks have a slightly higher GEP, which could be an indicator of their resilience to fire. And low GEP at the natural site could be a result um, of the unseasonably dry conditions of the summer that I mentioned earlier. Going into net ecosystem exchange, so due to the scope of this study, and as mentioned in my methods previously, trees are not accounted for when determining NEE, so this is the um, understore, understory net ecosystem exchange, and we can see here that NEE at the burn site is much higher than the natural indicating that this system is functioning as a carbon source. And we can also see that the NEE values at the natural site are also positive, which would be an indicator of carbon dioxide source. Um, however, these values are quite low and it can be assumed that if the trees were taken into account, that NEE values would be negative. So the natural site would actually be functioning as a carbon dioxide sink. And then because of the charring on the trees at the burn site, we can also assume that they are not capturing any CO2. And if they were taken into account, they would actually contribute to CO2 emissions. So the burn site would continue to function as a CO2 source. And moving on to methane. Um, so the methane flux was statistically significantly higher at the natural site than the burnt. And this suggests that fire can result in a reversal of typical peatland methane emissions as a natural function of a natural peatland, sorry, would uh, actually function as a methane source. Um, this reversal could be due to many factors such as reduced substrate availability like label carbon, um, reduction in the methane cycling microbial community, or changes in the way that the methane cycling microbial community functions. So looking at some environmental variables at the site, so the relationship between water table and methane was not statistically significant at either site. However, we can see here that water table is quite low at both sites, which would contribute to low methane fluxes, um, which is to be expected. And then, going into soil moisture. So however, the relationship between soil moisture and methane flux was statistically significant and also low at both of the sites, especially at the burn site, which we would expect to see. Um, and this again would contribute to low methane emissions. 
So some conclusions from this work. Um, so from this data, we can see that there is a clear shift in greenhouse gas dynamics. Um, a natural undisturbed peatland should function as a CO2 sink and as a CH4 source. And po post fire, we are seeing a reversal in typical peatland emissions where the burn bog is functioning as a CO2 source and a CH4 sink. Um, field work was conducted immediately post burn. Um, so the longer term impacts on greenhouse gas dynamics are unclear. However, literature suggests that this reversal can persist for multiple years post fire. And then talking about some of the future work. So to investigate the potential factors causing the shift in CH4 emissions post fire, several lab experiments were conducted. So through multiple soil incubations, potential methane production and oxidation were measured and used to determine microbial activity at the sites um, and to investigate the potential of um, impacts of the wildfire generated charcoal, a subset of these samples either had charcoal added, so from the NAPCA site we added charcoal to those samples, or charcoal removed from, from the burn site samples uh, prior to the soil incubation. So microbial activity ap did appear to take place at both of the sites. So after the incubation, we analyzed the microbial community composition um, through DNA extraction, um, then amplification and illuminous sequencing using the 16S RNA gene. And a diverse microbial community was, act was present. And so finally, the samples were analyzed for phenolics to determine if reduced substrate availability could be a contributing factor to the suppression of methane emissions. Um, and that's all for my talk today. Thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Abby. Okay, it looks like we already have a question in the chat. Um, they asked, what would your results show had you not been in a very dry period? Um, so I would assume that at the natural site, there would be more um, ecosystem production happening if it, it wasn't such a dry summer because the plants would be um, a little bit more active. At the burn site, um, there might be more methane emissions, but I'm not really sure if it very much would change at the burn site. Great, thanks. Um, and then another question, um, they think they missed this um, in their talk, but or in your talk, but can you explain why low soil moisture slash water table is linked to higher methane? Um, so I might have miss said this, but I believe that I was um, explaining that actually low soil moisture and low water table is linked to lower um, methane emissions. Um, so when we have a higher water table and higher soil moisture, we would see higher methane emissions. So sorry if I, if I mixed that up. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, okay, another question. Are you or other members of your lab aiming to continue some of these flux measurements this year, i.e. getting some spring fluxes? Um, so not myself, and I don't believe anyone else from our lab, but I do know that um, Dr. Mike Waddington's lab at McMaster University has been visiting the sites this summer, so they might um, be doing some future work at these sites. Great. Um, we still have a few more minutes, so we can see if anyone else put something in the chat. Okay, well, I think we'll move on. And yes, if you do have any other questions for Abigail, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and our other uh, session convener couldn't make it today. So I'm actually going to pass it over to Abigail to introduce me as the final speaker. Great, thanks. So our sixth and final speaker for this part of the session today is Miranda Hunter. And she will be presenting her research titled Carbon Production and Transport 
impact of water table fluctuations in bare peat column experiment. Great, thanks, Abby. So yes, my name is Miranda Hunter and I'm a PhD student at the University of Waterloo. And my talk today will be on the impact of water table fluctuations on carbon emissions in a bare peat column experiment. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank Evan Chang for his help with data collection, Becca Frey for collecting my P cores that I used, the funding sources, and my supervisors. A little bit of background. So my work for my PhD is looking at carbon emissions from actively extracted peatlands. And for those of you who do not know, companies start with a natural peatland, like the image on the left, they drain them and remove the surface vegetation, turning it to the peatland on the right. These actions alter, have several consequences for peatland function, but one of them is a change in hydrology, and it's specifically an increase in water table fluctuations. So the drainage causes an increase in subsidence, which decreases the specific yield, which then increases water table fluctuations. And so my work is focused then for this project on looking at how this increase in water table fluctuations will affect carbon emissions from the surface. So today I'll be presenting um, on this objective of assessing the influence of water table fluctuations on surface CO2 and methane emissions from bare peat soil. And in particular, looking at you know, what's the relationship between soil moisture and these carbon emissions, and if this relationship is the same on the rising and falling limb, and then finally, if there's a lag time in methane emissions following a water table rise. And this research is important not only for our understanding of dynamics in actively extracted peatlands, but also in natural peatlands, uh, looking at relationships between you know, decomposition and carbon emissions, because it's a great setup where we don't have the additional in, uh, influence of um, vegetation to worry about and how that will affect these carbon emissions. To do this, I did a lab experiment this past uh, winter of 2021, collected bare peat cores that were 45 centimeters deep and 15 centimeters in diameter, and installed soil moisture sensors at three depths to continuously monitor that moisture. And we measured surface CO2 and methane emissions using the closed chamber method and a trace gas analyzer. As I said, we then manipulated the water table to do this, we added water from above using a spray bottle to try and best mimic precipitation. And we measured water table using exterior tubes that ran up the side of the core and were connected to the bottom. And this gave a good approximation of the water table depth without disturbing the cores too much. I had two different treatments for my water table manipulation with three cores in each, a large fluctuation and a small fluctuation treatment. For the large, the water table was manipulated from negative 40 centimeters below the surface to negative 10, and for the small, from negative 30 to negative 20. And today I'll be presenting my results from this large fluctuation treatment. Um, and there were similar results between the two. So what exactly did what one of my fluctuations look like? Well, here is a schematic showing a core with a water table about 40 centimeters below the surface. At time one, we came and took a surface CO2 and methane flux, and then we added some water. Then at time two, we came back, the water table had risen a little bit. We took another surface flux of CO2 and methane, added more water. Time three, we took another flux, added more water, and then took a final flux once the water table was around 10 centimeters below the surface. And this water table rise portion was about four hours. And then we also wanted to take measurements as the water table was falling. Um, and we let this happen naturally from evaporation. And we took one to three fluxes on this water table fall, obviously aiming to take as many as we could. And then a final one once that water table had reached uh, around that negative 40 centimeters depth. And this water table fall was about five to eight days. So in total, I had three different cores that we replicated these manipulations on and we did five successive rounds of fluctuations, one right after the other. And so I'll present some of my results. 
starting with carbon dioxide. So here we have a plot showing water table depth on the y-axis and date along the x. And here I've plotted data from all five fluctuation rounds for one of my cores that gives a good um, representation of the patterns that we saw in all three of them. And you can clearly see the points where we added water and the water table got closer to the surface. And then as it fell back down, and then on top of that here, we have the data for the volumetric water content in the cores in the top 15 centimeters. And then the CO2 emissions from the surface. And there's a few patterns that I want to point out. So if you look at this green highlighted box here, which highlights one of the fluctuation rounds, you'll see that as soon as we started adding water, we see an immediate decrease in those CO2 emissions as the water table then is getting closer to the surface. And then once that water table starts to fall back down, we start to see an increase again in CO2 emissions. And this pattern held pretty much for all of the fluctuations that we did. And so how does that affect our relationships between hydrology and carbon emissions? Well, here is a scatter plot showing CO2 emissions on the y-axis and volumetric water content on the x. And this plot has all of the data from all three cores and all five fluctuation rounds in it. And the colors indicate whether the data was taken at a point when the water table was rising or falling. And you can see that we see a significant negative relationship for both. And this makes sense given that we know that carbon dioxide production is favored under oxygen uh, rich conditions. And we also see that the relationship looks pretty similar um, on both the rise and fall. So it's not dependent on the direction of water table movement. We don't see you know, higher emissions on the rise compared to the fall, for example. Now I will go on to our methane story, which looks a little different. So here is the same plot that I'd already shown with the data from one of the cores where we have the water table depth, the volumetric water content and CO2 emissions, and then I just added methane emissions up to the top. And you can see that it looks a little bit different than the CO2 patterns over these five fluctuations. And again, I'll highlight in a green box just one of the fluctuations to make it easier to look at. And so we can see that unlike for CO2, where we saw an immediate decrease in emissions, following that water addition, we see a short, a small spike in methane emissions as we're adding that water. And then those emissions go down to close to zero and stay that way for a few days post water addition as the water table is falling back down. This is different than what we saw for CO2. And this short you know, spike in methane, um, we saw examples of it in four out of the five fluctuations that we did for this core. And this is similar to the results for the other two cores as well. And it's a little bit hard to see these uh, spikes. So I have zoomed in on one example of them. Um, so you can clearly see, so we have the water table depth on the bottom and then methane data on top. And you can see that as we started to add the water, we saw uh, methane emissions around five micrograms of carbon and then up to you know, over 15 and then down to 10 as we were adding that water, and then it went down closer to zero a few for the next few days. We're not exactly sure what's causing this spike or you know, pulse in methane. We think it's <clears throat> unlikely that it's due to increased methane production, um, just because several studies have found that there is this lag time in methane production following um, exposure to saturated conditions. And so we're wondering if it could be from some forced displacement of methane gas by pore water as it's entering the pores as that water table is rising. Um, I do have some pore gas and pore water data that I need to analyze to see if that will help kind of support this idea or explain what might be happening here. Um, but it did happen in you know, four out of the five of the fluctuations for this core. And now looking at the relationship between methane and volumetric water content that I've plotted here. And again, the colors represent whether the data was taken on the water table rise or fall. We see uh, that there was a 
it's negative relationship for both of them. And this is a little bit surprising given that methane production occurs under um, oxygen limited saturated conditions. But what's likely causing this is just that the water table was never uh, maintained at the surface for very long. So we didn't maintain saturated conditions because the water table then did drop. And so this suggests that when we do see these short fluctuations in the water table, we might not um, see the standard methane soil moisture dynamics that we would expect if we were looking at you know, potential production of methane. I also see that um, the emissions look quite a bit higher on the water table rise compared to the fall. Um, it's suggesting a hysteretic relationship there. And to better illustrate this, I have plotted some data on this slide with methane on the y-axis, volumetric water content on the x. And this is data examples from one core and one fluctuation round. And you can, the colors again are on the water table rise or fall. And you can see that we see these higher emissions at the water table is rising compared to falling, likely due to those patterns that I showed where we see this pulse of methane on the rise and then this lag time of lower uh, methane emissions as that water table um, starts to then fall. And so in conclusion for carbon dioxide, it was generally what we expected you know, um, that negative relationship between CO2 and moisture content, and that this relationship didn't appear to be very dependent on the direction of water table movement. For methane, um, it was a little bit more surprising with that negative relationship, and then this potential pulse of methane that we saw on the water table rise and some evidence of hysteresis. And yeah, future work will be to, yeah, look, dive more into my poor gas and poor water data from this experiment to uh, see whether that helps um, better understand the patterns that we saw. So thank you so much and I welcome any questions. Great, thank you, Miranda. So we'll take some time for questions before wrapping up the session. So feel free to just type them into the chat and we'll give you some time to do so. Can I just ask my question? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We've done all sorts of typos. So um, these were cores that were done in the lab. How do you anticipate that reflecting what would be happening in one of those, like, you know, apocalyptic peatlands that aren't really peatlands, but bare spaces? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I mean, a few different points, I guess, you know, one, in that in these cores, you know, I wasn't doing um, artificial, you know, drainage, just letting the water table fall from evaporation. And these uh, peatlands, they do contain drainage ditches. Um, but I think that that drainage, especially in some of the older sites that they've been extracting for a while is pretty low. So I'm not sure um, how much of an effect that would have. Um, but yeah, definitely this summer, um, I'm doing work at that uh, field site and um, we have an eddy covariance system going and so we're going to look to see if we do see any evidence of uh, some of this potential pulse there. Great, so we have a question in the chat from Claire. So do you have any ideas about the potential influence microbial activity can have on the methane pulses? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I haven't done too much work on uh, microbial activity. Um, I do know that you know several other studies, um, both you know in the field and in uh, especially in uh, column experiments like this, have seen a lag time of you know at least a week um, for that increase in methane production following those saturated conditions. But it's a good um, thing that I should yeah look more into. Great, thanks, Miranda. So if there are no further questions, just in the interest of time, I'll pass it back to you to wrap up the session. Yeah, great. So thanks everyone for coming out and thanks to all the presenters um, for those great talks and for everyone who asked questions. I just want to remind everyone that 
We have the second part of this session this afternoon um, at 2.55 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and there'll be six more speakers. And then also there is the CGU Biogeoscience Section Annual General Meeting today at the midday break at 11.45 uh, Central Time. So yeah, thanks for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference series. Thanks, Miranda, good session.